July 17th, 2017 meeting of the Town of Scarborough Planning Board. Uh, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Karen, can you please call the roll? Mr. Dupree? Here. Ms. Saunders? Here. Ms. Hendrickson? Here. Mr. Fellows? Here. Mr. McGee? Mr. Bealey? Here. And Ms. Oglis? Thank you. Um, so note, please, that in the absence of Ms. Oglis and Mr. McGee, that both uh, Ms. Hendrickson and Mr. Dupree will be voting members this evening. Um, one other housekeeping note, uh, number 10 on the agenda, uh, item number 10 on the agenda, Yellow Birch Estates has been tabled. Um, it's determined it was not quite ready. Uh, next item is approval of minutes from the June 26th meeting. We have a motion. I make a motion. Approve. Second. All right. Any discussion? Uh, yeah, I'd like to just note some... I've unfortunately left my, my comments at, at home and didn't bring them, but I did have a comment on the Dresser Road site that I had asked for HydroCAD model and wetland peer review to be suggested kind of a thing. So um, I'll bring it up again when that's talked about here and I'll get Karen my markups. Of, it was basically just what I said kind of a thing okay. to mark it up. My apologies for not bringing it with me. That's all right. Any further discussion? We'll Make a note that that's to be tweaked. All in favor? Aye. That's unanimous. Thank you. Item number four, Martins Point Healthcare requests an amended site plan review for 153 U.S. Route 1, Assessor's Map, U47, Lot 92. Okay? Yep, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this item was actually on the board's last agenda. It was actually tabled at the applicant's request. Um, there was... So as you just noted, this is for a expansion at the Martins uh, Point um, uh, Healthcare Center on Route 1, and it's an expansion of the, uh, it's really just an expansion of the existing parking lot to add uh, 20 parking spaces. Staff has reviewed, um, subsequent to the tabling, the applicant provided some supplemental materials, which staff and our peer reviewers have looked at, and we're comfortable with the details at this time and have no further comment. Thanks, Jay. And I'll turn over to the applicant's representative. Great. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kylie Mason with Sebago Technics. Uh, with me tonight, I have Jacob Jepson from um, Martins Point. Uh, it's uh, really, just as Jay described, we're uh, requesting approval for 20 additional parking spaces on the back of the parking lot. Uh, the parking spaces will be constructed out of permeable pavers. Uh, it will provide uh, greater treatment. Uh, than th is there currently and certainly greater treatment uh, than in is necessary for the 20 spaces. So we think this is a really great opportunity. Um, it also allows us uh, one type of construction as opposed to bringing in paving for just this one small width of, of um, parking. Uh, we are proposing to pull the trees and the light fixtures back onto the slope <coughs> and to add additional uh, buffering to replace the trees that will be cut. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Before turning to any board comments, we do have the opportunity for public comment on this item. If there's anyone out there who has anything, seeing none, um, any board questions or comments? Just real quickly. Sure, go ahead, Robin. Um, Kylie, off the top of your head, do you know how, what percentage of uh, the runoff is captured on site with the improvements to both the buffer and the porous pavement? I think I know that, huh? Okay. <laughs> Let me see. I was hoping you'd say 100%. That was easy. I would, I would love that also. Um, let's see. Let's see. I don't actually have the number. Okay. Well, I'm sure if I looked harder, I could probably find it. Looks like what's required. No, I'm sorry. I don't have a total volume. I'm sorry, Robin. Uh, I have one question. I, I don't know whether you happen to know or whether staff would, would know. Um, 
how this level, this proposed level of parking compares with what was there before, like pre-fire, um, the old use? Do you happen to know or have a general I idea? I brought the old application, so let me see. Give me just a second to count them up. Okay. I should have music playing while I do this. I know. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> You guys are on the edge of your seats, aren't you? <laughs> All right, looks like there was somewhere around 100. Okay. Um, and this would put us roughly 20 more than we had. I don't have the table in front of me. So certainly less than what was there before, but also less intensive use. Right, right. And that was, again, sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> I appreciate you doing that. No, it's okay. Um, so, so it was a somewhat leading question. I, I just wanted to kind of highlight that, that it's still uh, is less impactful in terms of impervious surface than what oh, was sure. there previously. So I'm I'm perfectly comfortable with it. Yeah, you're showing a net decrease, right, of 0.15 acres. But then right. you were capturing, I thought we were, our, our goal was 50% for the redevelopment of that site. Is that for capture, yeah, I know we were. The treatment. Right. I know we were treating it before at the rate we had talked about. This actually adds to it and captures even more than 50%. So, uh, you know, whatever percentage that's going to be, I just don't know the total. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? <coughs> All right. With that, I will put a motion forward. The move to approve the amendment to the Martins Point Healthcare Site Plan is depicted on the plan set dated June 5, 2017. The proposed amendment adds 20 parking spaces and associated infrastructure improvements to the existing site and based upon board review has been found to meet the zoning and site plan review ordinance mm -hmm. standards. Second. We have a second. Any discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Next item, number five, KGN Properties LLC requests a site plan review for LOL, a daycare facility at 79 County Road, Assessor's Map, R15, Lot 78. Jay? Uh, yes. This is, yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, let's see, as you recall, this item was before you, I think it was at your earlier meeting in June. Um, this is for, as you just mentioned, a roughly 5,000 square foot daycare with a capacity of seven, uh, 75 students in the TVC2 district in the North Scarborough area of town. And actually I'm going to ask uh, Angela Blanchett to touch on a number of the issues that the board had previously talked about um, in, in greater depth. All right. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Since our last meeting, we've had some discussions with the applicant and talked um, about really the, the primary focus was the, the traffic um, and along that 22 cor uh, Route 22 corridor. And um, while we understand, the town understands that that's a bigger issue that we need to address holistically, there was some um, definite immediate concerns with the development going in and being that proximity to the corner um, and also where the majority of the traffic movement um, that will come in and out of the site is really left turns out of the site, and then again left turns from Saco Street onto County Road heading to Portland, really in the morning commute. So looking at where that queue length backs up, the concern was can this function from day one? And I think 
uh, while it's not completely the applicant's responsibility, and that's, um, but it looks like there was some low-hanging fruit that could happen maybe at that intersection to do a short-term sort of band-aid approach to be able to get them to at least function and, and get that left turn out of their site. And so I did go out and um, with Public Works and look at what's possible with that. And one of the things that came out of that was an exclusive left turn lane coming out of Saco Street onto County Road, so in that direction heading to Portland. Um, that the equipment out there, it is possible to do that. There is a cost to do some rewiring, some signal head work, things like that. So I did get a cost for us to do that. And um, in discussions with the applicant, we came up with a number that was slightly less than half that the applicant um, agreed to pay, and I think it was a fair, um, com you know, a conversation back and forth to say the town does take responsibility in the overall picture. I think this will help address some of that queue that would happen today with or without this site, um, but in also short term for their site to function and get left turns out of there. I think it's um, a good partnership, and I hope the applicant feels the same way. Um, the other issue that we um, talked about was the easements along Saco Street and County Road, which came up at the last planning board meeting in discussions with um, this being a town and village center district and looking at how that relationship with the sidewalk network. And while we don't have a plan today, it's definitely clear in um, our, our zoning that this is a place where we are going to want to put sidewalks in that connection. And while we don't have the plan today um, to actually say this is where the sidewalk goes, I think it's been pretty consistent with this board to ask for uh, easements for us to, in the future, be able to have the ability for the town to go in and install those sidewalks um, where, they, where they sit. So uh, the applicant has agreed to also um, provide those easements that um, are, are needed along Saco and County Road to accommodate those. And then other than that, it's really a lot of um, just minor technical um, things that staff um, and uh, Wooder and Kern had brought up that I think we can address at the <coughs> staff level <coughs> if um, the board gets to that point. Thank you. Okay. Staff also? Thank you. I'll turn over to the applicant. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Vinyl Appleby. I'm with the Sheridan Corporation, uh, representing KGN uh, Properties. And uh, joining me is Katie Norton. She's the applicant and, uh, and owner of the property. And Jim Anderson from uh, Sheridan's here as well. Uh, thank you, Angela. That was pretty much the... Uh, I was going to do a short and sweet uh, presentation. That was really the two big items, as Angela said. So um, I guess I, I, I really don't have anything to add. Uh, we made a few minor tweaks on the site. Uh, to enhance some landscaping uh, within the parking lot area, uh, and other than that, that's that's really about the only thing. And I did receive uh, the last round of uh, uh, comments, peer review, and staff comments uh, last Thursday. I addressed them on Friday, and and as as Jay and Angela mentioned, they were pretty pretty minor minor items from my perspective, certainly. So, be happy to take questions. <coughs> Thank you. If I should just, yeah, I did, did just want to mention, I should note that um, as board members will recall, this property is on the uh, historic preservation list, um, and so the applicant's been working with our historic preservation implementation committee, and I believe last we were here, that there was an agreement that was um, um, uh, uh, discussed between, between the applicant and the historic <coughs> preservation committee, and uh, board seen that, and hopefully you're um, and I saw the ad in the paper for the free house. There you go. Right. So <laughs> they've been working to articulate that plan. Yeah. So just want to make mention of that as well. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Any questions or comments left on this, Rachel? Yeah. The uh, among the notes is the note that uh, some of the mature trees on the property might be in danger from the, either the propane tanks or one other. Uh, buried area. Have you a any additional thoughts around that? Um, it, I'm afraid we did the best we could to save the trees. It looks like with a buried propane tank and um, with the enlargement of one of the biocells, because one of them reduced as a result of the, the uh, 
slight changes on the plan. Uh, unfortunately, we're going to lose those two trees that we thought we could save, two in particular that were mentioned in the in the memos. Thank you. Could you turn that? To the sure. I thought it was kind of. <laughs> Thank you. And for what it's worth, I'm trying to circle where the area of those two trees are up on the screen. If um, we were able to save uh, the majority of all the trees on the peripheral, just some of the internal trees have taken the hit. Roger, did you have something yes, else um, while Rick is pondering? Uh, on Angela's uh, comments, uh, she said we hope that the um, the applicant is agreeable to the um, the left turn lanes. So, can I assume you're agreeable to that? Uh, yeah, the applicant um, through discussions with staff, um, they suggested a, a, a an amount, a dollar amount, and and we are in okay. agreement to contribute that share. Okay, good. I think it's worth also noting that you know the the discussion around the county and Saco, <coughs> excuse me, intersection is a little different than our typical discussion with traffic impact fees, which do apply in this area, but really more at the Saco and Gorham Road intersections. And I know we talked about this a little bit at the last meeting, but I think it's just worth echoing that you know that this is a little bit of a different different beast than what we might typically sort of look at, and it has been a, a, a pretty good discussion, I think, all, all in all. And that amount is in addition to traffic impact fees at other intersections. That's additional amount. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Rick, did you have something? Yeah, I have a few. <laughs> um, not, bad, not hard ones, though. Um, as far as the bioretention cell that you had to relocate, so are they still in the same place right there? Yeah, the two that you see or that are you circular, it? more or less. <laughs> or, uh, these two here are in the same, place, <coughs> same location. The larger one that was over here, um, we had to push this road out because the exit drive ever so slightly because we stretched the parking lot this way. It kind of caused an effect thing here. What we did was we replaced this above ground bio cell with a, with a low ground basically a tank that's with vegetation in it, and that, that will do the same thing that these two do. Okay. Uh, had to re rework the numbers a little bit, so a little <coughs> less is going in this direction, a little more is going into that bio cell. But that little, as you can see it there, that's only a 7 by 13 size. Okay. Yeah. That's fine. And then the stormwater um, chambers that you have, um, I'm assuming that when you grade the site, you're going to grade it so that the water runs off towards those? Yes, I mean, the, 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 as you know, the site's wicked flat. <laughs> it is and, really flat. Uh, and the uh, proposed grade in this area is the same as it is now. These are all going to be below ground, so there won't be any mounds or anything like that. Right. And there's a little bit, there's a, what we uh, estimated or we calculated, a little bit of runoff in this northern property line. That won't change. Same, same number okay. and this direction as well. Okay. Yeah. There won't be any increase in either of those, no increase anyways, carried on the site. Okay. So the way you're going to grade it is the water's going to flow towards the stormwater chambers. Because yeah. right now it kind of flows Well, in this diagonally area, in this area I mean, if we were to get into the details of the drainage, this is, this is pretty much an existing drainage area, I guess. That's, yeah. that's unimpacted. Okay. They're not changing that at all. Everything here, you can see the bulk of the development is all yep. going in. Everything else is going to be graded the same. Okay. All right, that looks good. Um, and then there's a note on the septic system here, which I, I always look over to Angela when I um, talk about septic systems and stuff. But the septic system that's um, designed now is for the capacity of the 75 students plus the 14 staff and the whole. Correct. Okay. Correct. Okay. And then. Um, I did have one more question. Oh, I, I don't completely understand the left-hand turn lane. So coming out of Saco Street, mm -hmm. there's going to be a left-hand turn onto 22 heading towards Smiling Hill Farms? Right, currently there are two lanes, um, which is something recently that Public Works had 
it was kind of a makeshift two lane, but it wasn't defined. So we went out and actually added some signage, and there are two heads there. Um, so we actually formalized the fact that there's two lanes. And what happens is that left turn from Saco onto County Road, as you mentioned, going to Smiling Hill Farm, really backs up um, well beyond um, this site back to, I can't remember the, the side street that's back there. Libby that Road. In, in, the, in the morning commute, it backs up that left turn. Um, and so with this, Right now, they have to wait for that the, the cross traffic. Whereas, what we would end up doing is providing a exclusive phase. So we would have just that movement, that left turn movement, the ability to go um, and clear that that queue. Whereas right now, it does not. It's just a green ball. It's you have to wait for for others coming okay. the opposite direction in order to take that left. You have to wait for a gap. Whereas this would provide an exclusive phase, so that you would just it would just be a continuous movement of that left turn. Does that make okay. sense? Time, so we're going to add a light there with an arrow, basically. Yes, we'll add another. The okay. signal heads would be adding another, you know, another ball, basically below with the left arrow. Okay. Yep. All right, that makes sense. Um, yeah. I think that last stormwater tank should be turned this way, but as long as you guys do the engineering, I'm sure you'll get it right. So, I trust you. Okay. This? Yeah, it seems to me like it should be at a 45 degree angle based on what I've observed, but, you know, you guys will do surface grade? Yeah. Well, this is all below ground, and so, I mean, it could go in any orientation, but the, the, the topography of what goes back in, if we did the hole and fill it back in, should be exactly the same. Oh, no, I'm not worried about the aesthetics of it. I'm just thinking right. functionally, I think oh. the water runs at a 45, not straight back. Well, these are fed by, by collection. They're, they're, these are fed by a pipe that all comes over. So these the bio cells only take us the very first amount of oh, okay. Then the rest of the rainwater bypasses the, the, uh, the bio cells, go into a catch basin that's located at all three locations into a pipe here, and then that infiltrates. That, oh, that's that makes more sense. That's basically a low-ground detention box. Okay. I bet you knew that. No, I was waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Other than that, I thought the rest of the questions, you guys did a good job of answering them. And, um, I didn't see exactly where the signage was going to go. Oh, actually, I think I did at one time, but I forgot because it was a month ago. The, oh. the where? signage? Yeah. It's on right there. Oh, okay. And, it, and that's set back um, 15 feet, so we're not going to be in the in the easement yeah. that we're offering, as well as it, um, <coughs> the memorial or the historical feature is going to also be outside of that 15 feet. Okay. In that location. Yeah, that's all I have. I think it looks good. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? I just, I just would like to take this opportunity to thank the applicant and their design team. I think this has been a very successful collaboration with the town, and I thank you all for, for really understanding the traffic impacts that are happening here. Um, I think this is an, an incredible opportunity for the town, and you've, you've navigated not only traffic, but easements and historic and aquifer overlays and the like, and just thanks for, for your collaboration with, with town staff. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll echo that. Absolutely. Much appreciated. Um, and also thank the Historic Committee for the time and effort that they put into into this to come up with a good um, compromise <coughs> and a good workable solution. Um, yeah, so this has been pretty well vetted. Um, and uh, I think, you know, it's been a, an example of a good kind of iterative process where I think we've gotten to a good outcome and certainly appreciate the owners, um, the applicants' willingness to partner on the on the um, intersection infrastructure. Um, it's a good, creative, public-private solution. So thanks again. Um, with that, I don't have any other questions or comments. And if there are no others, I will put a motion forward for approval. 
I move to approve the application of KGN Properties LLC re represented by Sheridan Corporation under Chapter 405 Zoning Ordinance and Chapter 405B Site Plan Review Ordinance with the following findings and conditions. Uh, findings as stated, I will not read all that, but it will all be in the record. Uh, conditions, number one. Prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall A, execute and record the maintenance agreement required by the Post-Construction Stormwater Infrastructure Management Ordinance, B, provide revised plans to address comments in planning staff's and Woodard and Curran's memos. The plans may be reviewed and approved by staff, <coughs> and C, pay mitigation fees which include A, $5,000 for the Historic Preservation Agreement. B, $5,000 toward traffic mitigation at the County Road and Saco Street intersection, and C, traffic impacts fees in accordance with Main Traffic Resources Memo dated February 21, 2017. Condition number two, prior to the issuance of a certificate of occupancy, the applicant shall execute the necessary documentation for the sidewalk easement along County Road and Saco Street. And condition number three, a pre-construction meeting is required before the start of construction. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer and their contractor, and utility company representatives if applicable. The pre-construction meeting may be scheduled in coordination with the town engineer. That is the motion. Second. We have a second. Any further discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank, Thank you. you. Good Thank luck. you very much. Thank you. Item number six, Resvera Properties LLC requests a subdivision and site plan review for Carrier Woods Apartments, a residential subdivision at 79 Muzzy Road, Assessor's Map R55, Lot 18. Jay? Yep, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just by way of background, board members would make recall this item received a preliminary approval back in May for uh, the sub subdivision and site plan elements. Um, We'll just note that I think even before that, this uh, property was subject to a rezoning, which brought most of the property into the TVC3 zoning district. There's also a small portion of the property in the VR2 district, and we are also in the aquifer protection overlay district. Um, so as noted, um, this item had been before the board for preliminary review, and there had been um, even outside of the elements that the board has seen. Staff has gone back and forth on a number of items with the applicants um, and, and uh, you know, addressed a number of the issues that we had moving forward. And I think we're in a pretty good place at this point. One thing staff wanted to bring to the board's attention now, this is before you for final approval, does have to do with our growth management ordinance. Um, so the growth ordinance management uh, Growth Management Ordinance, <laughs> without going into too great a detail, uh, really has sort of two pools from which permits can be allocated. One is just sort of an annual allocation, and one is a reserve pool allocation. Um, the reserve pool is actually subject to a recent council discussion in this last winter um, based on this project and a couple other similar projects um, um, coming down the pike. and. Um, the reserve pool is actually added to. I sort of bring this to the board's attention because the growth management ordinance states that it's this board that can identify which projects are eligible to draw from the reserve pool. The growth management ordinance basically provides four or five criteria which a, a, uh, a development needs to meet, which this application does by uh, utilizing the affordable housing provisions of the ordinance. Um, and so at this point, we're looking for the board as part of your um, draft motion if you were so inclined to see that this project would be um, uh, uh, eligible to draw from the reserve pool. Um, doesn't mean it has to draw from the reserve pool, it sort of opens that option. Um, and, and certainly I can talk more about that, but I think at this point I'll, I'll sort of leave it at that for, for the time being. Um, <clears throat> I think with that, um, there are a few other issues to 
that we wanted to just talk about the timing uh, in regards of, and that has to do with the affordable housing development. Um, and I'm sure the applicants sort of walk us through how they're going to approach that those issues, as well as the off-site uh, mitigation improvements for uh, Muzzy Road. There's a left-hand turn lane to be developed on Muzzy Road, and the applicant's been working with DOT and town on the final design of that. Um, I think those are the main elements that I wanted to flag. Um, let's see, Angela, did you want to touch on anything? I miss the phasing plan. Did you want to touch on that? or? Um, sure. Uh, I had made some comment. Um, I think I had talked to the applicant a little bit, too, about making sure the phasing of the project makes sense as far as the stormwater perspective and that if we're drawing a line at I think it's just primary, it's two phases, right? So where that phase one line ends and making sure, um, typically we would look to have the stormwater management systems in place to um, as, as the phases get built out. So right now the line, while it's probably just simplified, looking at the phasing plan, I just want to make sure that there's more discussion underlying, which can be between staff and the applicant during even during pre-construction uh, meeting, if that for that matter. But making sure that that's incorporated, that that system gets in place to be able to treat whatever's built, so that a phase one could stand alone, I guess, basically. Thank you. That's what we have, I think, at this point. With that, I'll hand it off to the applicant. <coughs> Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I'm Jim Fisher with Northeast Civil Solutions here uh, representing this particular project uh, before you this evening, and uh, Rocky Risbara is here also. He will address you for any uh, particular questions that you have regarding specifics about the, uh, the build-out and um, what the aesthetics of the project may look like. Jay's already basically taken us through uh, what the uh, stages of the project have been thus far, and Angela has uh, certainly um, addressed some of the things as far as uh, stormwater is concerned that I'll mention here in just a moment. And again, in the interest of brevity, we'll just go through the comments, uh, given that we've been here a couple of times before, uh, that Jay has provided for staff, for as staff, for comments. And then we'll open it up to any questions and we'll address any comments that you might have. As he mentioned, as far as the growth management ordinance is concerned, that is up to the planning board to determine from which pool we end up taking the, uh, the number of units that we're looking at. Uh, there are quite a number available. We're looking for some this year, and um, the remaining would be typically next year. Uh, as far as the phasing is concerned, we are looking at uh, searching for final approval this evening so we can begin construction immediately uh, or as close to that as possible. With the build-out of the first phase, which includes all of the infrastructure and two of the buildings uh, immediately, meaning this year, uh, ostensibly we would end up finishing toward the very end of the year, right before uh, the end of the year and before the cold really starts um, freezing things up a bit. And then the rest of the year, the remaining portion of the project, as far as the buildings are concerned, the remaining five buildings, would then ostensibly be uh, constructed next year. Uh, so that at this time and into the autumn next year, everything would basically be completed. Uh, as far as the uh, timing for the affordable housing units, as Jay mentioned, we would like to be able to propose that uh, one of those units will be in the uh, first phase, in the first building, the first phase and then we try to go every other building. And there are seven buildings, so we would be one, three, five, and seven uh, for the timing on that. As far as the off-site improvements are concerned, uh, the only buildings that actually trigger the off-site imp uh, improvements are the latter two of the seven. So the first five buildings don't really trigger that. Nevertheless, obviously, we're working with the DOT and with the town on the uh, improvements to Muzzy Road. There will be a left turn lane in, similar to the painted uh, walkway or the painted uh, drive on uh, Muzzy Road right now that turns into Gallery, and the Gallery Boulevard. That will be removed and uh, it will be extended as the middle lane all the way down, similar, to some, somewhat similar to Route 1, which you see there. And it will come all the way down from Gallery to this particular access point. Um, as far as the, uh, the entrance is concerned, there will be a uh, construction entrance that will not coincide with the uh, specific entrance uh, that will be uh, the end result. This construction entrance will be tied directly into the parking <coughs> lot so that everything toward the uh, the end of fa completing phase one with all the construction of the parking areas and the, the island, the mailboxes, the full access left in and left out uh, will all be completed relative to that particular entrance. Uh, as far as the uh, the payments are concerned for in-lieu fees, uh, you'll see in your, sta in your um, comments that uh, payment of the in-lieu fees for the affordable housing 
uh, really should be considered prior to the start of construction. Absolutely no problem with that. That will actually be, the plan is to have that done this week, uh, far prior to any construction beginning. Uh, establish of the uh, two affordable units should be tied to a specific development milestone. That milestone would be, uh, again, the first building that would go up with the first two that are in the first phase would accommodate uh, those units. And as far as the timeline is concerned uh, for uh, completion, um, we do propose, as we stated, to be able to build out all of these, uh, the affordable units, uh, with the remaining phase that would go into place in the section time, this time next year. As far as the uh, um, utilization of timers for outside lighting, there's a fair amount of uh, lighting that is um, on site. And uh, all of that lighting, including the uh, exterior building lighting, notwithstanding the porch lights, will be, which will be controlled individually, will be on dusk to, di dusk to dawn timers. There's no issue as far as that's concerned. Regarding signage, uh, we just don't have specific signage at this point. We'd like to be the board to be able to issue that as a condition of approval with staff. It's a simple sign. Uh, as you note on your uh, plans, it will go right in the island. It will have uh, illumination above it with one of the same type of uh, uh, lighting poles that will be uh, throughout the area. Uh, we will obviously make sure that uh, signage complies with all regulations, and we'd like to be able to show that to staff at a certain point in time coming up. Uh, there's no real hurry on that, given that signage uh, is typically going to be in conjunction with and following the uh, creation of the first two buildings. Um, as far as the uh, um, subdivision notes, uh, we included the, uh, for number five, a plan note that identified that the, uh, the buildings are indeed, from a subdivision standpoint, conceptual at this point, uh, even though the site plan will be uh, also finalized basically concurrently with this one. That note is on the plan. Uh, we sent that language to Jay this afternoon. He did get a chance to take a quick look at it. And it is on the, uh, the plans and the mylars that uh, we have for tonight. Finally, the, uh, um, so the applicant has divide, divided the project into two phases. Again, the drainage <coughs> will be 100% uh, uh, before we would request any type of occupancy of the first phase, the buildings or the units in the first phase. Uh, so anticipating uh, Robin's comments, we are dealing with 100% of uh, a stormwater mitigation on site, stormwater retention on site before anybody moves into any of these structures. With that, I'll open it up for <coughs> questions or address any comments you may have. Thank you. Uh, for starters, if there is any uh, additional public comment, this would be the opportunity for that. <coughs> see any takers? So we will <coughs> turn to the board. I want to take a crack at it. Uh, I can start. I just have one or two, maybe. Um, the this the maintenance garage. I'm sorry. I think you said it's not shown yet on this plan, but you it's on the one that's in, been submitted. Or well, can you show uh, me about where it is? It's actually not a maintenance garage anymore. It's this one right here. It's now a storage facility that will act as storage for uh, additional storage for all the units. So it's no longer going to be maintenance of any equipment. Okay. So it's just going to be, you know, storage area. I, I'm just curious, is it is it sectioned off so that each unit has some storage, or is it just a general storage? Area? Um, it's a bit of both. Yeah. It's going to be interesting because you've got quite a bit of um, quite a few units. Yeah, there's quite a number of units in there. Small storage for some people, obviously, and then some of the bigger units and the bigger area items may be stored independently. Okay. And um, where did we end up with the fence on the back side of the property? Uh, there's a fence that starts right here. Yeah. And you'll see that on your final plan. It's planet. the split rail fence though, right? Yes, correct. I'm talking about the very back edge. Back in there? Yeah. Was there any, did we just put anything there? I know we had some discussion about it. Yes, there is a dog run that's back in this section that's got a fence that's proposed for it all the way around, and that literally goes just inside the rear property line. So essentially from here all the way up to here and then down this way, we've got fencing coordinates to separate our property from the abutters' properties. Okay. And it's split rail on the, is it chain link across the back or what is it across the back? Um, okay. Good evening. Rocky Risperra. I can address the, uh, the fence uh, question. Um, I assume you can hear me. The, um, Rocky, you should probably swing that mic around though, just so the. Yeah. So we're proposing a split rail 
along a little piece along the line here, and then down this line to where the topo really drops off. Mm -hmm. And that's just to kind of demark the area of you know the property line. Right. And we'd have probably a couple of little signs on it that just say, you know, please respect property line. Yeah. And then you were talking about on the back line here we have a dog run area, so there's quite a lot of chain link fence. Okay. It's almost it's not quite the whole back of the property line, but it's a good section of it, and it kind of takes us down to an area where the property drops off again pretty steeply. Right. So we felt like we were, uh, and then the same line. <coughs> We've got a drainage pond here, so we we felt like we were really marking off the property line pretty well with fencing, so that people would understand where the where the property was. Okay, so the chain link fence kind of stops where the dog part stops, and there's not yeah. really any fence around the back of the retention pond. That's correct. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. I just know we had some. Um, at the last meeting, there was some public concern about maybe having a fence, but it looks like you've done. So after you, you, after that meeting, I did go out yeah. and, and walk the site again and really took a close look at, and, and there's a section um, huh. on the abutters property that's fairly flat that I could see, you know, hey, maybe somebody would walk right. their dog over there if they didn't know any better. So that's primarily in the area of uh, the split rail. Um, so we felt like that was a good way to just mark the area. It's not going to... Keep any, you know, keep an animal off, or but it's going right. to, you're going to be able to know this is the line. Right. So we felt like that worked there, and then the um, dog run area, you know, encompasses a long section of the back line, and so we kind of took those areas to where it, it steeply drops off, just areas where we didn't think anybody's going to want to go in there that, that area anyway. So right. we and felt like we we met the the need. Right, you met the spirit of it, I think, with marking the. Mm -hmm. At least making it clear as to where the property line is. So, other than that, I didn't see anything else. Okay. It looks good, Rock. Thanks, Rick. Anyone else? Uh, I just had a question. If I could just have the phasing explained one more time. Mm -hmm. Buildings one, three, five, and seven. Is it this year? So, um, there's a couple of things that we're addressing there. So, as far as the affordable units, mm -hmm. proposing. One unit in the first building, the third, the fifth, the seventh. Ah, okay. So once we start every other building. Okay. Um, and the way that this project will actually get built out, the first building will be ready for occupancy about five months from the day we start. And then once that's <coughs> ready, mm -hmm. the second building will be ready the following month. Okay. And if the weather has been with us, the third, the fourth, the fifth, we broke the project into two phases, more uh, because of drainage. That front section, those two buildings, all go to the front yep. drainage area. Everything else goes down back, and it kind of splits. Some goes to the left, some goes to the right. So we recognize that in order to get the third building on, we need to have all the drainage done in the back. So we're anticipating that we can do that before the snow flies. Great. So, um, so then are you in general agreement with what the town is proposing as far as getting the off-site or the stormwater management done as part of phase one? Absolutely. In case? That's, we're, we're moving forward. And you know, part of our phasing plan, we're showing kind of an alternate entrance in yep. the beginning. Yep. And that's going to allow us to be working from two sides. Perfect. You know, all the utilities come in on the right-hand side, if you will. Mm -hmm. And we'll be able to come in, lay all the utilities in, build a road on that side. Meanwhile, we're on the left side, we can work on the buildings and get those going. So Excellent. We anticipate that it, that it would be all base coat paved and, and the drainage systems would all be up and running. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Richard? Yeah, I, I want to, uh, when you first brought this to us, I, one of my concerns was a place um, for community, for for folks to get together, which you don't often find in large apartment complexes. And I want to compliment you on the work that you've done with the uh, putting in the place for community gardens, uh, for the, the dog park, uh, and the bane of an apartment dweller's existence <laughs> is lack of storage uh, and it providing those storage areas, at least for some of the, the units, is going to be uh, a tremendous relief to some of the folks there. Um, I like the design as it, it's currently uh, considered. It's not a rigid row of houses, apartments, you know, marching down the street, but instead seems to 
really uh, harmonized with the land. So I appreciate the work that you've done, and I have no further questions. Thank you. I, I appreciate your comments, and I, I will have to say that Keith Smith had a big hand in that. Thank you. Anything else? Anything to add? Yeah. Roger? <coughs> Um, I just have a couple of questions about the growth management ordinance, and I don't want to open up a can of worms, but I just want a clarification. <laughs> um, it was my understanding, and this is probably to be answered by staff, I, I, I was under the impression that a developer could either pay a fee in lieu of affordable housing units. But the way I'm reading this, it sounds like they're going to be doing both, no? Correct. Um, all right, so uh, <laughs> the ordinance allows, th there are two ways to get to the affordable housing density bonuses. One is the in lieu fee, and one is uh, providing affordable housing. Um, so what the applicant is proposing is they are uh, a density bonus of 10 units. Five of those units they're paying for using the affordable housing in lieu fee, so that's 100000 hundred thousand dollars they're paying okay. um, and then the other five units what the ordinance says is you have to do is provide of those remaining five at least 40 of those units need to remain as affordable units 40 so percent 40 percent I'm sorry yeah. thank you 40 percent all right so that means two of those whole units need to be affordable now with this project we get into they're also taking, use, utilizing the uh, res, res, <coughs> residential density factors provision in our ordinance, which says that a unit that's one bedroom and less than 750 square feet counts as a half unit. So really what this project is providing is four affordable units, one bedroom, less than 700 square feet each, and then $100,000. Okay. Uh, so. Okay. Uh, then the other... <coughs> I wanted to raise that because this, this is a recent, you know, developed uh, audience mm -hmm. or whatever you want to call it. And it's hard to understand it, and especially where we have um, so many apartment complexes coming online in the future. Now, the other thing I wanted to ask, um, are these permits coming out of the regular annual growth permits, you know, out of the 135, or are they coming out of, out of the reserve? Do you, do you we know that? Well, so providing that this board finds that it, this projects eligible to come out of the reserve pool. There may be some mix. Um, really, that will be a discussion that I would have to have with our zoning administrator who actually allocates the growth permits, but certainly um, we'll have those discussions about which is the appropriate pool for, for these to come out of. Um, but as I did mention, this, amongst those other projects you had just referenced, uh, were part of the due consideration that council gave when they looked at the reserve pool. Okay. Um, I will note, you know, on, on your point as to the affordable housing being sort of new and complex, uh, I think Rocky can certainly attest to that. We went back and forth a couple of times, and it's, it's not easy, um, but, you know, it's the numbers, it, it truly does just become a mathematical equation. You just got to keep churning the numbers, and they, they get you there, but it's... There were some great minds involved, and, and I was involved too. <laughs> <laughs> we eventually got to the, got to make okay. the numbers work. That's all I have. Thanks, Roger. Yeah, I think the questions, uh, the few remaining questions coming into this have been pretty well addressed, and this is another one that's been well vetted um, at this point. Um, you know, the reserve pool <coughs> and the affordable housing piece is a little bit, uh, it's a little bit fuzzier, I think, and and may take us uh, as a board a little while to just kind of get our heads around how that's going to be administered going forward, particularly as we get into some of these larger scale proposals. Um, but as I understand it, um, the role, at least in this case, for the board is really more kind of administrative um, and sort of confirming that yes, we agree that they meet the letter of the eligibility requirements. And um, I would agree with staff's interpretation that they do. Um, uh, I'm also comfortable with the, the phasing and appreciate the, the willingness to, um, and I don't think it took any convincing necessarily, but um, the, uh, the clarification at least on the, the phasing as it relates to the infrastructure and how the affordable housing is going to be layered in. And I'm glad that that's um, sort of mapped out um, and not being 
uh, kick down the road, and I think that's a testament to again these ongoing discussions to try and to get try to get things right. Um, I am perfectly uh, happy with the level of fencing um, and just sort of delineation that's being uh, proposed here. Um, you know, as, as Rocky said, I think a lot of it is sort of just that visual cue that this is the property line. Um, and I think, um, you know, I appreciate the extra effort and time to, to look at that based on the public comment last time. And then finally, I'm also uh, comfortable with, and I uh, assume that the fellow board members are, uh, unless anyone wants to speak up now, with um, having staff review the final signage as, as uh, proposed here. So beyond that, um, I don't think I have anything else. I think we need to belabor, belabor it anymore. Um, so I do have a draft motion. There is one item related related to signage that, that was just added to the draft motion that, that you all have in front of you. Um, I move to approve the application of Resbera Properties <laughs> LLC represented by Northeast Civil Solutions under provisions of Chapter 405 Zoning Ordinance. Chapter 405B Site Plan Review Ordinance and Chapter 406 Subdivision Ordinance with the following findings and conditions. Again, the findings as stated. I will not read them. Uh, conditions. Number one, <coughs> prior to the issuance of a building permit, the plan set shall be revised to address the items and staff comments related to lighting details, plan sheet notes, and the phasing plan. Final plans may be reviewed and approved by the Planning Department staff. Number two, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall pay traffic impact fees, execute and record the maintenance agreement as required by the post-construction stormwater infrastructure management ordinance, pay the affordable housing in lieu fee, provide final design of the Muzzy Road off-site off improvements for approval by the planning board staff, a planning department staff, Execute and record necessary documentation for the conveyance of the Honan Road right of way extension and associated snow storage easement. Condition number three, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall execute and record the declaration of affordable renter occupied housing covenants. In addition, the initial development of the affordable housing units are to be developed not later than as follows. One unit in the first building, one unit in the third building, one unit in the fifth building, and one unit in the final building. Number four, a pre-construction meeting is required before the start of construction. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer and their site contractor, and utility company representatives if applicable. The pre-construction meeting may be scheduled in coordination with the town engineer. And, construct and uh, condition number five, Final signage design to be reviewed and approved by planning staff in accordance with the provisions of the signage standards. That's the motion. Second. Any further discussion? The applicant might have a question on could, those. Could I, okay. could I interrupt? I'm sorry. I just want to be sure on the timing. On the, I didn't hear what you said on the timing of the Muzzy Road plan acceptance by staff. Is that by the, the plan by the uh, issuance of the first building permit? Okay. That's because that's what we're talking about. Okay. okay. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure it wasn't prior to building permit issuance. So. Okay. Appreciate it. Appreciate Robin? Um, I, I propose or I'm wondering if, if we should add to condition number four, uh, the pre-construction meeting may be scheduled in co coordination with the town engineer and will include a schedule to ensure that the off-site stormwater management is built as part of phase one. Is that necessary? We can certainly add it. I guess the first condition talked about the phasing. It did. It, okay. The first condition said we're going to revise the phasing plan. Okay. And I would assume in that that would be part of, since that was part of the discussion, that's what that Perfect. phasing plan will be revised to. And typically, as part of the pre-construction meeting, we go over that phasing plan and be sure we're all working off the same thing. And we'll have the minutes from this meeting anyway yep. to capture sure. that. Thank you. So, okay. Thanks. Okay. Anything else? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> 
Item number seven, Rosbera Properties LLC requests a preliminary subdivision review for 31 Dresser Road, Assessor's Map R31, Lot 18. Jay? Thank you, Mr. Chair. This application was before you at your prior meeting. I think it was just your prior meeting uh, for a preliminary review. So just bring you up to speed again. This is a conservation subdivision in the RF district. Just as a reminder, conservation subdivisions are required when a lot meets certain threshold or criteria. Uh, in this case, it's one acre or more of wetlands, so it requires, again, that conservation uh, design, which uh, reduces the lot sizes. Uh, basically, it's a, a density neutral design, but requires at least 50% of the area to remain as open space, and, but it does allow smaller, smaller lot sizes and reduced road frontages. Um, <clears throat> so the applicant did provide some revised plans, which staff uh, provided you some comments on, um, particularly with regards to uh, a request for a waiver of roadway width, um, configuration of lots, uh, consideration of street trees, detailing of wetland crossing, and uh, thinking about some street lights. I should also note that the planning board, at least three, three members were able to uh, participate in the site visit that we conducted last Tuesday, I believe it was July 11th. Uh, Susan Oglis, Nick McGee, and Roger uh, were all out on site, as well as uh, some of the neighbors were able to mm -hmm. join us as well. Um, I think at this point, I will uh, leave it at that. And Okay, you can pick up your conversation from the right. previous meeting. Thank you. And I will turn it over to you, Nancy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Nancy St. Clair with St. Clair Associates. I'm here tonight on behalf of Ruth Barrett Properties, LLC, uh, to present to you again the preliminary subdivision plan for Dresser Road subdivision. As Jay mentioned, this is a 10 lot conservation subdivision. We did have a site walk with some of you folks uh, last week on the 11th. Uh, there were a couple members uh, from the public who joined us on that site walk as well. So we had an opportunity to discuss uh, the neighbors' concerns uh, right in the field uh, and give some of the board members an opportunity to see uh, firsthand the site. So uh, the other thing I did want to point out is we have received a letter from the DEP. They have accepted our application for a stormwater permit as complete, and they are in the process of conducting their review uh, of those application materials. So uh, Jay had mentioned that we, in the interim between the uh, June 26th planning board meeting and tonight, we had submitted application materials that addressed all of the peer review comments and staff comments that had been received to date uh, on the application. Those materials were reviewed by both the town's peer reviewer as well as staff, and we have been issued uh, a couple of updated comments, and they are pretty brief, so I was hoping just to sort of go through them item by item uh, to indicate uh, basically where we stand uh, with those uh, items. So I'll start with the staff review memoranda. And uh, the first comment uh, is with regard to the 22-foot wide proposed roadway. This actually was in response to review comments that we received as part of our prior application materials and a suggestion that the board had been in the past comfortable with a reduction in the roadway width from 24 feet down to 22 feet. We are proposing uh, that and are requesting a waiver on that. That will um, help to reduce the overall impact of the project uh, with regard to impervious areas on the site. So we are asking you folks <coughs> to consider that as a waiver request. And the next comment is with regard to the lot envelopes. And if you recall from our last presentation, we had a discussion about the stream that was identified uh, on the site. That stream was identified and located and shown on the last presentation materials. It's on here, it's in yellow, it's a little bit hard to see. Uh, but it is in the application materials that we provided in response to the staff comments. The comment that's made here is that the rear corner of lot one the building envelope is actually within the 75 feet uh, from that uh, stream limit, and the recommendation is that we adjust the building envelope to stay out of that, and we are willing to do that. So that will be adjusted uh, as part of that. The um, other item is of note that in the event that any disturbance is required within 75 feet of the stream, that 
an NRPA permit by rule be filed, and that note will be added to the plan. We do understand that. We've had that discussion uh, amongst ourselves uh, as part of that process as well as with the DEP. Uh, <coughs> so those two items, that's sort of <coughs> bullet number two. And the bullet number three in the staff review comments is with regard to street trees. And um, uh, the comment is with regard to the fact that there's a lot of evergreen trees on the site and that they may not uh, withstand uh, the construction of the road if they were left in a smaller stand. So we do understand that. We have looked at the potential of putting in street trees. We've noted it that in the areas where there are not sufficient trees that would be remaining, that we would add up to two uh, per lot and that those would be specified likely as a maple tree, but we will work with our landscape architect to identify a specific tree, caliper, et cetera, if street trees are proposed on an individual lot. The 25-foot no disturb buffer pins, we uh, had received a comment to look at the placement of those, which would be every 50 feet. We'll look at that on the plan and address that if there are areas that are extended beyond the 50 feet. The driveway restrictions at a hammerhead, that's a typical <coughs> detail that can be easily added to the plan. We don't anticipate having that as an issue given the fact that we do only have uh, two lots up in that area, but we will add it to the plan. We do have that detail uh, from the town. With regard to homeowners association documents, we'll provide draft information with regard to that as part of our final submittal. And uh, as Jay mentioned, he had requested that we provide a detail of the proposed wetland crossing. We do have one crossing. Those who are on the sidewalk uh, know its location, know that it's quite small. Uh, that area is about 2,378 square feet, so it's below the jurisdictional limit that would require a permit from the DEP or the Corps, but we will provide a detail of that particular crossing uh, for the board's review as part of final. And the recommendation with regard to uh, the installation of a street light at the end of the road, we would certainly uh, place that and we'll coordinate with staff on its timing to tie into the LED uh, programs that the, the community is working on. The staff review comments also reference peer review comments. This is round two as provided by Woodard and Curran. They've done the peer review of the site, the stormwater management, uh, et cetera. Their comments are basically boiled down to a couple. One is with regard to the placement of the electrical lines. The <coughs> staff review has recommended that those electrical lines be actually placed in an easement outside of the uh, pavement area. This is the only utility uh, in the road. We have it actually off the shoulder. We'll work with staff to provide an appropriate location for that. And then uh, Wood and Curran had asked for a detail on the buried electrical lines, and we will provide that in coordination with CMP. The last two items are with regard to the post-construction stormwater infrastructure management ordinance. We had received comments from Woodard and Curran on our stormwater report, their review of our modeling data, et cetera. We addressed all those. There are no additional comments with regard to that. The only two items that they do note is that we have provided sizing calculations for the soil filters, and they've asked us to show the location of the proposed four bay on the drawing sheets. Each one of them have that, so we will provide that information as part of final. And the last item is that uh, the project is under review by the DEP, and Woodard and Curran has asked that um, we provide a copy once it's approved of the permit, and we certainly will do that. Uh, as I mentioned, that is under review. So with that, um, we also wanted to note one last item. <coughs> we did receive uh, an email um, from Mr. Ed Alden. His email is dated Monday, July 10th. We saw him actually on the site on the 11th. Uh, some of the comments that he had in this uh, email to you folks, he also discussed with us on the site. Uh, hopefully we had answered some of his questions there, but you see he's in the audience, so he may have some comments as well. Uh, so with that, we are here tonight to seek preliminary subdivision approval. The project is under review at the state. Once the state permits are obtained for stormwater, we will be coming back to you folks hoping for final. Right. Thank you. Um, we do have the opportunity for public comment. If anyone uh, has any comments to make, just come on up and give your name and address. Uh, keep your comments to five minutes or less. Go right ahead. 
at all in 24 Dresser Road. I thought at the last discussion there was going to be no street lights at the end of the road because we have no street lights anywhere else on Dresser Road other than that Holmes and uh, Beach Ridge Road. And like the other two little side roads don't have any street lights. That's my only comment. Okay. I'd like to try to keep that, you know, I like to see it's dark down there. <laughs> so, thank you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Chair, I'll just note that the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, email that Ms. St. Clair mentioned uh, was provided to the board members as well. Just want to be sure right. you're aware of that. Okay, thank you. Uh, no other public comments? Then we'll turn to the board. Roger, I believe you were actually part of the I was. expedition I was. that went out there. Um, I, interesting sight, especially with all the pine trees out there. And I was just kind of curious, um, and maybe this could be addressed by Rocky. Um, when, when the road goes in, I, I, I know you're going to clear a lot of the pines away from the, you know, the building footprints, you know, maybe 25 feet away from the structure or something. But what, how do you handle the pines along the road? Because there's an awful lot of pines there. So basically anything within the right of way will no longer be there because of the way the road gets built, the ditching, the drainage systems. Um, in the areas where the uh, drainage systems are, those will be cleared. And then when you come down to the individual house lots, um, quite a lot of the building footprint, the building window area will get cleared. Because one of the things that, that you've got to recognize we're doing here, we're taking an area where lots were going to be two acres in size and we're dropping the size down. It's all part of the conservation subdivision ordinance. But what that means is I've got a smaller area to work with. So there's not a lot of trees that are left within the immediate area around the house. And, and we always try to, anything that's within about 25 feet of the foundation has got to go. Even if it survives a couple of years, it, it won't survive long term. So um, I'm not sure if I'm fully answering your question, but a, a fair amount of those trees will be gone uh, to get the house, the driveway, the septic system, you know, get all of those things in. And so I think it's, it's very likely that we will wind up planting some tree, you know, street, trees along the street uh, to try to augment that, that you know, eventually will come along and be nice uh, deciduous trees. But the, but the pines that were planted 30 odd years ago, you know, a lot of those are going to go. Yeah, well that's what I suspected might happen, but I just was kind of curious. Uh -huh. So we, we try to work with the lay of the land, we try to put daylight basements in where we can so that we're not filling any more than we have to. That also allows us to have a smaller footprint, but, but the truth of the matter is that, you know, on the, when the lots get smaller, it, it's harder for us to save trees. Okay. Um, all right, so I have no problem with the 22-foot width uh, roadway. Um, on the street light, um, is that a public safety issue, Jay? Or is, uh, is that totally? Oh. I'll, I'll defer to <laughs> on this one. Um, we do have a policy on street lights and where they get placed. We had a lot of requests um, through public works. Um, about the addition of street lights, and so my that was my comment um, in staff comments about adding a street light at the intersection because that is part of the policy. And what I'm finding is in locations that don't have them, we get requests. So I feel like if we don't put it there, the residents moving into Dresser, this Dresser Road subdivision, are going to be calling Public Works and requesting that one get installed. And if you look at the policy it meets that policy. So in turn, I feel like eventually someone's <coughs> putting a street light up there. Um, so that's where I, I put it as it probably should be part of the developer um, doing the project rather than a year from now public works paying to put a street light up. And I'm, I'm saying specifically at the intersection. Um, not, I know we talked about maybe sometimes they do them at dead ends. Um, the hammerheads and things like that, I don't think that's necessary. Any additional within the street, within the subdivision. But the actual intersection, as was mentioned, it's a long straight road. They're on either end. It's, it's dark. And to find that turn, um, I, just, I just know from just the two years I've been here, all the phone calls I get about looking at intersections where subdivisions were placed without them, that I have a feeling that we'd be putting one out there. 
that's just my sense. Um, but we can go either way. I'm, I'm comfortable going either way. It's just from the experience okay. I've had, that's what I've seen. Um, I, I think that's all I have. Okay. Thanks. Anyone else? Robin? Um, yeah. You mentioned that the project is under under review by DEP, but then you said that the Chapter 500 permit is complete, or you checked with DEP and it is done? <coughs> the so DEP has issued us a letter indicating our application is complete, oh, okay. and it is under review by Got it. DEP. Okay. Um, so you're not, because you're calculating uh, less than 3,000 square feet of wetlands impacts, you're saying that you, you won't need any NERPA requirements. That is correct. Okay. And you're also saying then that the amount of impervious area on this site is going to be, and you mention it too in your comments here somewhere. Wait, where is it? Yeah. Identifying the, to oh, the total disturbed area is how much? Uh, you put it somewhere on there? It's in one of my letters. Yeah, you're saying it's a note has been added to the plans? Correct. We added the notation to the plans. I believe the disturbed area, let me just get it here. And I was probably not looking at the right plan. I was just wondering where it was. So we estimated the, the new impervious and the developed areas at 1.35 acres of new impervious okay. and 3.07 acres of developed. That's impervious plus landscape areas, lawn areas, those types of things. So did you include the road? Yes. And, and provisions oh. for each house. A provision for each house and a driveway? Yes. Okay. In the hammerhead? Yes. Okay. And 22 or 24 <coughs> foot road? Those numbers are based on 24. Okay. And so you're saying only 1.35 acres of oh. new impervious? So there is some existing impervious out there? No. No. no it's, okay. It's all new. And the total disturbed area then, Nancy? The developed area is 3.07 acres. The total <coughs> disturbed area, I'm not sure if I have that quantified in this report here okay. that I'm looking at. Okay. So in the, that, that was, uh, I'm on page three of your response to staff and peer comments dated, I don't see a date. July 3rd. Am I looking right at it? There, July 3rd. Yep. My notes were right over it. July 3rd. Um, so page three, the top, it said the applicant should include the total disturbed area. So we, we should definitely have that. and. I have, I have also been interested in the past, in, at the last meeting, um, because this is a conservation subdivision and it's of, uh, I think, of importance that we w that we think about um, potential wetland impacts here. Um, that the hydrocad model and peer review of wetland be considered. Um, if not, has the conservation commission sort of is it? Is it typical for the Conservation Commission to weigh in on any of these conservation easements? Um, there's some, there's, I guess I'm, I haven't seen a lot about the characterization and the existing conditions of the wetlands that are there. Uh, in our description of the site, we talk a little bit about the wetland bands that cross through the yep. property and the wetland fingers. Yep. As part of our program, <coughs> um, uh, First of all, when you talk about the HydroCAD review of the project, all of the data, all the HydroCAD modeling information was sent and reviewed by right. Woodard and Curran. Those are the outputs. So I'm looking for a peer review of the actual HydroCAD model itself, including the assumptions, because something like this, it's really important that we calculate or, or we anticipate the amount of storage that those wetlands are providing on site and those are the calculations that I think we need to really take a look at and understand how much storage and how important those wetlands are on site so that we can model it really accurately or appropriately. 
As part of the output information that we do provide, uh, as part of that, I'm not sure if you've had a chance to look at that. Yep, uh, typically, here. the data goes to the um, peer reviewer. There's, there was about 137 pages worth of calculations. Right. Those calculations include summaries yep. of each of the subcatchments. So the assumptions of impervious area, times of concentration, mm -hmm. all of the individual segments of the T sub C flow path were reviewed, were submitted for review by Woodard and Curran. In addition, the reaches, which were, as the analysis goes and the water flows through some of those wetland areas, those reaches were described. Uh, hydrograph models were presented mm -hmm. as part of that, showing how the flow goes through each of those segments of the reaches. So absent of actually giving them the electronic model, in my opinion, they have had all of the information right. and have had an opportunity to review that. And, and I respectfully disagree. Um, that the outputs have been reviewed, but the actual, what the nuts and bolts have not. So I will, again, make another plea to have the HydroCAD model. And I, if I can yeah. just suggest, if you just uh, send over the, the electronic, uh, the actual, I mean, I, I have the software. that I think what she's referring to is that we can just have the HydroCAD model and we can just review it. Mm -hmm. I think it would be simpler. Perfect. Yep. <coughs> Thank you. And um, so I'm also, am I also, you, you've also made some modifications then to Nancy to make sure that the 25 foot buffer setback from the buffer is being honored and respected consistently throughout the site? We have adjusted the original <coughs> layout. Yep. We respected the <coughs> 25 foot upland buffer from all of the wetlands okay. around the property. Yep. There are no wetlands within any individual lot. We have 25 foot upland buffers that established where the lot lines were. Mm -hmm. In recommendation from the first round of review to today, we've made some adjustments to those lot lines that increase that buffer beyond that 25 feet. Good. Just simply because the natural contour of the wetland provided additional jogs that if we straightened a few lines, we could increase that 25 foot upland okay. buffer. And when was the wetland delineation done? Delineation was done uh, earlier this year and was initially looked at earlier, uh, later last year. So it was done later last year, followed up earlier this year, and there was a vernal pool assessment that was done and you folks had. Oh, right. That was the Mark Hampton study. That's correct. Okay. Um, again, I still would assert that the wetland peer review is, <coughs> is necessary at this site, considering the conservation subdivision and, the, again, the, the importance. Um, the if I could just add to that, mm -hmm. um, when we did the site visit with the DEP, they were out there, looked mm -hmm. at the delineation. Yep. That's where we talked about the stream. That's where <coughs> that happened just before we, before you folks before. So the DEP field biologist has been out there, has looked at the site, uh, mm -hmm. and has made their determinations on the property as well. And I did have an answer to one of your questions that you asked. <coughs> time. And that is with regard to the open space. Mm -hmm. There's 13.72 acres of open space provided as part of this um, property. Of that, 3.21 acres are wetlands. And as I just mentioned, there are no wetlands within any of the lots. So all of the wetlands are in the open space. Mm -hmm. That represents about 23% of the open space. The remaining 77% of the open space area is upland, and that's uh, about 10 and a half acres. So when, when did you go out with a DEP biologist to look at this? Uh, in Probably was the 23rd of June. Okay. I think. So fairly recently. Maybe something okay. like that. Yeah. And so, did they did they go all over the site and look at all the wetlands with you? They did not walk the entire site with me. They mm -hmm. were familiar with the site. They did their reviews internally with their databases, and then went out and looked at areas where yeah. they had some questions. Yeah. So the National Wetlands Inventory is probably what they consulted. Um, they have a different database. They have um, it's in the street database, yes. Um, no, I, it's a compilation. I think there's some NWI information, but they also have some other data that they rely on for that. Okay. <coughs> I will leave it at, I still assert that we need a wetlands peer review. And um, I guess my final question, since I'm asking everybody tonight, is uh, what percentage of the... Uh, Stormwater will be attenuated on site. I have that number. Right on. 
So we are required under the stormwater law to treat 95% of the impervious area of the property. We are, we are providing treatment to 96.5% of the impervious area. And we are required to uh, treat 80% of the developed area, and we are providing treatment to 88.9%. Okay. Sounds good. And um, yep, I guess that's, that's all I'll have for now. Thank you. Thank you. Rachel? Yeah, thank you. Um, I have no questions about this, about the, the subdivision, subdivision plan at this point. But I would like to make an observation about uh, from Mr. Alden's comments. And I have a fair amount of sympathy um, to his comment about the lack of shoulders on the road uh, and the potential danger for children walking along there. I live on a small um, dead-end road off of Scott <coughs> Hill Road. I have, upon occasion, jumped into a ditch. Uh, to avoid the traffic coming over the hill. Uh, unfortunately, I don't believe that Scarborough has any triggers that would create, um, I don't know, a, create a reason to widen the shoulders of some of our roads as development comes along. Uh, according to Mr. Alden, there's a 42% increase uh, proposed in a road that's a mile long. Um, as we go into the comprehensive plan, that might be something for the folks in the comprehensive plan to take a look at. The impact of some of the development into the areas, uh, into the more rural areas to ensure that there is safety for the, the people who still want to enjoy walking along Scarborough's roads. So I appreciate uh, Mr. Alden bringing that to our attention. And I do think we might want to look at recommending um, some sort of trigger to the transportation folks for widening shoulders. Thank you. Thank you. Rick? Yeah, the only thing I would note in the um, comments and I think is important is the um, pins for lot two and four to um, mark the 25 foot no disturb area. I'm sure you guys, I'm sure you do a good job of marking that, but we ha have had people come back that have encroached in areas where they shouldn't have encroached. So if we can make sure those are marked out good so we don't have to come see you again after you're all approved. And thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so I think we're, yes, Jeff? No, Roger did his first. Sorry, yes, he did. My, my mistake. <laughs> You're allowed to have one. <laughs> one, that's it. Um, <clears throat> so I think um, all in all, we're in at a pretty good place here, at least in terms of preliminary um, approval, uh, in my opinion. I don't think we have any um, real showstoppers or deal breakers here. Um, just sort of reviewing some of the discussion points. Um, uh, thank you for the update on the on the DEP. Uh, application status. Um, I appreciate the willingness to to address the, the concern and the comment about the, the rear corner and the and the and the setback there. I also appreciate, and as we always do, um, avoiding having wetlands on individual parcels. Um, and I'll I'll come back to the, the sort of the general question of of wetland delineation and, and review in, in a minute. Um, I'm okay with the 22-foot road width. Um, however, I, I think it's the, the point, the comment about the shoulders is a point well taken, and it's not really directed at the applicant. It's more of sort of a, something for the town to look at going forward. I agree, um, particularly since there are places where we, it just doesn't make sense to have sidewalks and um, sort of a basic safety consideration. Um, just looking through here to make sure we're sort of covering everything. Um, the street light question, I think, um, and I think that that's a, a good discussion. I appreciate the clarification from from uh, <laughs> Angela on sort of the, the, the policy perspective on that, um, and uh, we can look at that going forward. Um, going back to the sort of peer review 
peer review, peer review, if you will. Um, I do appreciate the willingness to share and review sort of the HydroCAD inputs. In terms of having peer review for wetland um, delineation, um, you know, it's not something we've typically done as a as a sort of a standard practice, and we've done quite a few. We've looked at quite a few. Um, uh, conservation subdivisions over the last few years. As we've talked about, it's sort of, there's not a whole lot of low-hanging fruit in Scarborough when it comes to buildable land, so we do we tend to see a lot of that. Um, and as Rocky explained there, and as we've seen in the past, there are always some trade-offs there. Um, so I guess it's, in my opinion, uh, the question of whether we request peer review of wetland studies or things along those lines, maybe something best to take up offline with staff and have staff look at and maybe maybe it could be a workshop topic for the board and staff. Um, one concern I have just sort of thinking about it on the fly here is, um, you know, we try to be sort of as predictable and standardized as possible and I'm a little wary of sort of, you know, picking and choosing specific projects to focus on there. Um, but I, it's a valid question to raise, and I think we can certainly look at it going forward. Um, beyond that, I don't think there are any questions that I had that have not been addressed either through your your review, Nancy, or the other uh, board members' questions. We do appreciate the public comment um, in person and by email. Um, and with that, again, I think um, I think this is ready for preliminary approval. Um, and I will move to approve Resvera Properties LLC requests for preliminary subdivision approval for 31 Dresser Road, Assessor's Map, R31, Lot 18. Second. I have a second. Any further discussion? Yes. I would just like to note that um, Ms. Oglis isn't here, and I feel like we didn't quite touch on all of the, the sort of tree and landscaping mm -hmm. aspects kind of a thing. So okay. just Thanks. wanted to note that. Great. Any other discussion? All right. All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chair, just for forward to seeing the next space. Clarification as we move towards final. Um, <clears throat> just want to be sure. I'm, so in terms of the wetland delineation, I think at this point with this project, we're not moving forward with that. And I just want to be sure we're clear on um, yeah. peer review. A peer oh. review of the wetland delineation. Um, and then it was also mentioned about the Conservation Commission. Again, that's something that, you know, at the board's request mm -hmm. in the past, you know, maybe once or twice a year we've sent to the commission. And again, I just want to be sure uh, staff's clear as to the expectation of the board coming back. I didn't hear that sort of catching um, traction, if you will. Um, and then I guess the last item would be on the street light. Um, at this point, the, I think I guess it wasn't entirely clear if the board was in favor of seeing a street light. And again, we do have final to talk about it, but just in terms of being able to put the plans together um, and coming forward, if we could, um, it was staff's comments, and I think Roger, you were the one who suggested maybe it's worth doing. But well, let me ask you a question on the street light. Yeah. Say the um, the homeowners on this new development. They come forward and they want a street light. Mm -hmm. I imagine the people on Dresser Road, the existing abutters, could come back and say, "We don't want a street light." So, what do you what do you do in that situation? Uh, I guess my point of view is we would look at the policy, and um, there there are a lot of street light requests, and we have to prioritize them, and we would prioritize them by intersections and dangerous curves, and this would end up on the list. Mm -hmm. okay. Is there a way to put uh, money in escrow for if it's needed? Or am I opening up a whole new ball of wax? Staff can certainly take a look at that. Thank I, you. I'll answer it that way. Okay. Now, now, there's no street light at Dresser Road and Beach Ridge Bar, Dresser Road and Homes. Is that correct? There is at either end. There's no yeah. there's no street light at either one, right? Or is it? There is. Oh, I thought you yeah. said. No, not on the road. There, no. there are two other smaller subdivision roads. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Was okay. it Pyre? Pyre and Nottingham. Yep. Okay. Okay. Mm. So, was the conservation commission invited to go to the site walk? 
Um, they were not. Okay. Because I think I was on a site walk a year or two ago, and the Conservation Commission came. Correct. And we and did end up doing a wetland peer review mm -hmm. there. So I, there is precedent. So I would be happy with, you know, either, well, never mind. I, I do. I, I mm -hmm. completely understand that comment, and I do mm -hmm. think, as you say, there there have been cases where we've done things like that, and uh, I don't see the conservation commission review as as an additional layer right. that the that the applicant has to go through. I think exactly. we sort of picked our spots there in terms of <coughs> complexities or profiles of the site, um, but I do think we, as with this and with other things, we need to be careful about um, kind of selectively imposing additional requirements on applicants. Sometimes it, sometimes it's, it's just clearly merited, um, and there might be just differences of opinion about it, but I think, um, I personally think it's um, necessary in this particular case, um, but it's something we can talk about going forward. Rachel? Um, since I'm on the Conservation Commission, I, I, I do think uh, that at least the, the commission should be notified that there is a conservation subdivision plan going through. Then what the commission decides to do from there is up to the commission. Thank you. Seems like a straightforward yep. enough thing to do with the protocol. Okay. Great. Thank you. I think, I think you have that enough has direction. Direction and clarity there. Hopefully the applicant does too. I okay. didn't confuse things more. Okay. All right. Thank you. So just as a matter of course, that's preliminary approval, so the application will come back to the board for a final review. Um, it's a two-step review process. So. Thank you. Moving on to item number eight on the agenda. Black Point Holdings <coughs> LLC requests a sketch plan review for a new multi-tenant building at 20 Black Point Road, Assessor's Map U43, Lot 11. Jay? Uh, yep, I'm going to give a quick zoning context and I'm going to ask Angela to weigh in on this item. Um, as you just mentioned, this is a uh, proposed development for a multi-tenant commercial building, a roughly 10,000 square foot commercial building in the TVC2 district. The TVC2 district allows a building footprint of up to 10,000 square feet, um, but limits tenant sizes to no more than 5,000 square feet. So um, there can be one t two tenants of 5,000, or it could be they can distribute the 10,000 however they like, I suppose. Um, so that's just by way of context. I will also mention just again by to help put the site into. Um, sort of position town. It is the home of the former Widow Walk site, which actually, when that property was removed, was one of the sort of impetuses around the town looking at the historic preservation uh, properties that was already <coughs> removed. It's not something we're dealing with here today, but I just sort of mentioned that by way of, again, more context for the board. Mm -hmm. Where this is sketch plan, this is an informal review. Uh, there's no expected action by the board, but it's certainly a time to talk about sort of the the issues that the board might see coming down the pike. And with that, I'll turn it to Angela as um, I think she can address what those and issues by staff are. If I could just quickly, I'll just add that um, at, at the next step, uh, there will be an opportunity for public comment as, as we get into the first phase of the full-fledged site plan application if it does go to that point. Okay. Um, I think this is a great application to come in front for sketch plan because obviously the big glaring um, issue is traffic and really site access specifically. <coughs> um, everyone knows Oak Hill and the issues surrounding Oak Hill and uh, Transportation Committee Roger is a part of um, has been looking at Oak Hill and actually was formed specifically to start looking at um, Oak Hill intersection and the traffic concerns um, related to that. Um, this is obviously down Black Point Road from that and there was um, provisions at the former Bella Vida site to have shared access which obviously the plans that you're seeing show that connection which is exactly why it was, it was placed that way. Uh, the concern is you start looking at specifically the left turn if you're coming from Oak Hill 
into the Bella Vida site, which then I would also connect with this, was designed for the capacity of that facility, which my understanding is that facility is not at capacity, that senior housing there. Um, so as of today, it might not be an issue with the left turns going in there. It really comes down to seeing a lot of data. I think we're going to need a lot of explanation and a lot of description um, and reassurance, quite frankly, that you can actually access the site. Um, where this left turn lane into that shared access butts right up against the left turn as you're coming out of Black Point to turn uh, southbound on Route 1, those abut each other. From, so there's no room to expand, really, that left turning lane into Bella Vida. Um, so it really needs to look at more of a global picture and unfortunately that includes Oak Hill in this case um, and how you can get in and out of that site. Um, I think we need to look at access on both sides of that property as well as how that interacts with Thornton Ave across the street um, and as well as almost looking at, we might have to look at this kind of from from reverse than we typically would to say what actually we might want to look at what is the uses of that building and maybe really traffic is, is the key point to say what can that site actually facilitate because there's going to be some higher generating traffic that maybe can't function in that site. Um, so it's, it's really a really big discussion and I know it's a lot to tackle but um, it is something that as I said, the Transportation Committee has been um, <coughs> trying to deal with in, in pieces um, from the Oak Hill and working our way out. Um, so I think uh, we'll, we'll be looking closely at the information that comes in and how that works and, and we might want the Transportation Committee to actually look at some things that you might be suggesting because I think it does fit into a bigger picture and that we need to look at it as a whole. Thank you. And I'll hand it back to Nancy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Nancy St. Clair. St. Clair Associates. We're here tonight on behalf of Black Point Holdings, LLC. Um, Dr. K is here in the audience over here. Um, Scarborough Family Chiropractic will be the anchor uh, in this building, but there is additional space available for up to two additional smaller tenants uh, to occupy the building. We certainly do fully understand uh, what Angela is discussing with regard to traffic and circulation and we came in and reviewed the plan <coughs> for the what's now called the Atria Center, the Bella Vita Center and you know looked closely at where our points of access might be recognizing that we are right on Black Point Road. As part of our initial work on the project we've brought Bill Burry in to do our traffic and evaluation for the site. Bill has done some counts including counts specifically at that entrance I talked to Bill today about the comments that we've received. Our intention is to sit with staff with Bill, go over what he's got for data thus far. Um, he's done counts at the, I believe at the Oak Hill intersection, at the entrance to <coughs> the Atria Center and a couple of other intersections uh, in the area. Those counts are recent. They were done uh, just within the last few weeks. So it's new and updated data uh, that I'm sure will be useful as part of the analysis. So we do understand that. We do understand about access management and control. Uh, in that quarter and are certainly willing to uh, work with the staff to come up with a program that's you know, mutually acceptable for the applicant who owns the property uh, as well as tying into what the infrastructure is there and what's available uh, for the site. So if we can just talk a little bit about sort of the overview of the site and then um, we can talk a little bit more about traffic and access as well. So as I mentioned, we're proposing, uh, it's a little under 10,000 square feet, 9,970 uh, square feet building. It's in sort of an L-shaped building. Uh, it has its uh, longest length, if you will, perpendicular to Black Point Road with about uh, an 86-foot facade along Black Point Road. In the TVC 2 district, there's a minimum front yard and a maximum front yard. And our building is set a little more than 55 feet back from uh, the current right-of-way limit of Black Point Road. The reason for that is we have reviewed the plans that were prepared for the adjacent property for the Atria Center, the Bella Vita Center. And as part of that process, the town actually took about a 30-foot strip 
along that frontage. So we've set our building back at this point, acknowledging that there may be uh, a desire on the part of the town to have some additional right-of-way in that area, but that is one item that we do want to, to refine and define uh, with the town if 30 feet is too much, if, you know, what is the appropriate dimension, recognizing that we are back a bit from the Oak Hill intersection. So with all that, we've set that building so that if that had to occur, we are still within that 25 to uh, 60 foot, regardless of, of how that shakes out. So uh, we would like to have that as sort of one of our talking points when we meet with staff to better understand that. We are providing for a primary entrance to the site uh, through the Atria Center entrance. We have a two-way in and out uh, on that, as you can see in the plan. So that's in the, what would be the northeasterly side of the site. That's right here. So this white piece right here, it's sort of the dashed line, that is an access easement that benefits this property that is um, on the adjacent Atria Center site. So we're coming in and tying into the entrance here. The building for Atria is actually up here off the, off the page. So our primary entrance would be in here. We have parking located on the northerly side of the building and some on the easterly side as well. And we also have a 22-foot wide proposed access which would allow a right in and a right out off of Black Point Road. So folks who are coming northbound on Black Point Road would have the opportunity to come into the site not having to go through that intersection up by the Atria Center. And exiting vehicles would have the opportunity to leave the site at that same location as well. That is generally across from Thornton Road, but it is not a full entrance as part of our proposed plan. It's simply a right in and right out for that. <coughs> So our plan is still in uh, concept as far as internal design goes uh, and building elevations. We will be providing <coughs> uh, to you as part of sort of the next steps in the process. But we did want to highlight a couple of things that we, we do have for sort of ideas for that. The uh, primary entrances to these units would be on the northerly side of the building. You'll see there's a couple of hatched areas there which would be provided for uh, barrier-free parking for the primary entrances to the building. We anticipate that the chiropractic center would occupy basically this piece of the building, so that would all be the chiropractic center, and then the two smaller units would be in that area there. There's a sidewalk that connects to the sidewalk along Black Point Road that runs along the front and sides of the building. And you notice this sort of L-shaped area in here. We envision that to be a secondary access to those units, employee access, not not public access, but employee access uh, for the units, and that that sort of green space area there be sort of a plaza type area for employees to come out and maybe have their lunch or take a break out there uh, as well. So <coughs> project size-wise, we don't anticipate that we're at a, a higher level um, with stormwater permitting. I did note uh, in our review comments from staff that I believe Angela wanted to discuss with us some specifics and ideas for the Oak Hill area and we're certainly open to working with staff on low impact design and, and whatever the vision is uh, for the community in that area. So uh, with that, we'll certainly take any questions that you folks may have. Thank you. Thank you. Who wants to go first? Roger. Okay. Here's Mr. Oak Hill. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Oak Hill. Um, uh, obviously, the traffic is the issue, is going to be the overriding issue. And what struck me when I first saw the plans was the uh, right in, right out, you know, roadway there, and the rationale behind that. Because I, I go through that Black Point Road all the time, and uh, you have to have your, you're looking all over the place when you're going anywhere along there. And I would think having that, you know, a access and exit right there across in Thornton is just another another place that people have to keep an eye on besides traffic going up and down Black Point Road. They've got to be looking across the street as well. So I'd just like to know what your rationale for that. Well, that's not a full entrance, so it's just a right in, right out. Oh, I understand so, that. Yeah. So traffic coming northbound on Black Point Road would enter the site, and exiting vehicles would exit the site only on the northbound lane. So we're not crossing traffic. There's no left turns. There's no um, sort of 
crossing over onto Thornton, that type of thing. Um, and as we go forward with the designs, obviously signage, that type of thing, striping, that type of thing would be key at that particular location. The benefit for having that access is it is a reliever for people coming in and out at the Atria Center. There's an opportunity for people to not have to come up as close to Oak Hill to get into the site and come back around. The other benefit to that is from an access standpoint with vehicles that may have to come in for a delivery or emergency service that they don't have to back around because absent of having another means of access or ingress on that property, it is a dead end layout. And so this does provide for a more of a through connection uh, in, a, you know, in a delivery or an emergency situation. Um, okay, uh, I'm glad your rationale. <laughs> Um, I, I, I'm, I'm just a little leery about all the, you know, trying to keep as many curb cuts along Black Point Road as possible. Uh, we, we really have a dilemma in this town with Oak Hill, and um, we don't have too many, too many options as to how to get. You know, you almost have to go through it. Um, the other, the other point that came up on the uh, staff comments was the fact that in these particular zones we like to have the buildings face the road and I, I can understand what you're, what you're doing here because of the shape of the lot so um, you know I, I don't I don't really have a problem with that um, I, I guess the overriding thing to me was that that particular road the access the right in right out that, that's the thing that concerned me so that's all I have thanks Roger Anyone else? Rachel? Yeah, um, I want to echo a little bit about Ro what Roger was talking about, and that was the, uh, the, the positioning of the building on the lot. Uh, with additional tenants, are you assuming that there is only going to be one major entrance so that the other tenants are entering their offices or uh, premises through uh, an inside door? No, along that northerly face, we envision that probably the primary entrance to uh, the chiropractic office would be, we'll say, on the northwest uh, corner of the building in that area. And then on the northeasterly side, I envision that there's probably going to be two doors. They're probably going to be relatively close together. But again, the architecture hasn't <coughs> been defined. But if you generally look at where those um, hatched patterns are, those are envisioned for areas where we would have barrier-free parking, and that's typically quite close to where the building entrances are. Um, I also remain concerned about um, at basically a side wall facing uh, Black Point Road. Uh, we saw a an industrial uh, another building uh, plans recently that essentially had a door that was, uh, I'm not sure how, how I can describe it, but at the, uh, at the point of the north and the west corner, that, that corner was actually sliced off so that the door actually could be visible from the street and from the parking lot. And I've seen that plan a couple of times in town. I don't I don't know, that might be something to consider. I'm not sure how other folks on the, the planning board would would think about that as an option, but it does create uh, a front-facing, a part of a front-facing facade, and there may be some other designs that can be used to bring that building a little more in accordance with some of the design plans. So as, as you go along, um, please keep that in mind. That, I'm, it, I at least am going to be looking at, at that and how the building is presented to the street. And I have, uh, I, I defer to my colleague, <laughs> Mr. Beely, who knows a lot more about uh, traffic flows uh, in, uh, in the Oak Hill area, but um, that also remains a concern. It's, it's a heavy traffic there, and uh, it's a problem that's, in a sense, you're inheriting. Thank you. Thanks. Sir? I don't have anything at this point, no. Anything, Robin? No. Okay. Thank you. Um, so 
Ms. Oglis could not be here this evening, but she felt strongly enough about this item that she did provide a, an email here, which I will read into the, into the record, and then I'll put my own hat on. Um, the greetings, Jay. My response to an item of the next Planning Board agenda, Black Point Holdings, LLC, 20 Black Point Road. As I see it, the major issue for the applicant is traffic. It's not about the amount of additional trips generated, it's the vehicular movement into and out of the site from Black Point Road. It's only a matter of time before accidents begin to regularly happen at the Black Point Road Route 1 intersection without this added complication. Today, which was, this was written on Monday, July 10th, between 6 and 9.30 a.m., traffic waiting to turn onto Route 1 from Black Point Road regularly backs up to the Nonsuch River Bridge. Between 3 p.m. and 6.30 p.m., southbound traffic waiting to turn onto Black Point Road from Route 1 backs up to Hannaford Drive. This leads to a lot of irritated people running yellow and red traffic signals at high speeds from all <coughs> directions. Another point of the entrance and egress amidst this stressed intersection will do nothing but aggravate the situation. Thank you, Susan Auglis. So um, that certainly, I think, is consistent with, um, you know, what we knew going in was sort of the, the main concern here. In my mind, really, I think what we're hearing from other board members who've spoken to this point, really, you know, the big, the big threshold question. Um, and while I'll have, I'll certainly have a few brief comments on some of the other items, um, that's really, you know, traffic is obviously the, the elephant in the room. Um, and so we'll certainly look forward to hearing um, about that analysis and that data. It's certainly good to hear that we have some midsummer counts in there. Um, so we'll have the best slash worst case scenario, depending on how you look at it. Um, but I tend to agree actually with, with Ms. Oglis and a couple of the other comments that um, it's not necessarily just the volume, but the particular movements. Um, and there's so much going on here at Oak Hill and in this corridor between the Oak Hill intersection itself, um, you know, the Amato's that's up there and, and some of the movements that happen around that and the gas station and then coming on down the hill, you've got the Eastern Trail, which particularly this time of the year has a lot of activity with people crossing, Eastern Village is being built out. Um, so I'm stating a lot of obvious things, but I just, you know, I, I think it's important to really paint the, the whole picture. And, um, you know, it's nothing you don't know, but I think just, just to amplify um, the level of concern slash skepticism, if you will. Um, so we'll, you know, we'll do what we always do, and and we'll look at the we'll look at the data, and we'll look at the recommendations. And there's always a measure of subjectivity that comes into it, particularly when there is a public safety concern. So um, you know, we'll we'll take a look at that and and sort of see where that leads us. Um, you know, I, I do think I, I do understand and appreciate the, you know, the, the right in, right out movement uh, across from Thornton Road, and it's good that you're able to take advantage of the easement through through Atria. One one thought that does come to mind with that, you know, going forward um, at a level of a little bit more detail, is thinking about pedestrian safety throughout the site when thinking about the circulation, but in particular to the extent that we're using Atria, um, the assisted living facility, as, a, as an access point. We'll obviously want to make sure that um, we're extra careful about pedestrian safety measures there, whether it's signage or stamped pavement or whatever, whatever the case may be. Um, this is somewhat, somewhat unusual um, means of access. Um, Mr. Chair, if I could just yes. add to that. Sure. Um, we did take a look at sort of where we do come in on the Atria Center site. Um, that access easement actually goes to full depth of this property. We specifically chose the location um, sort of at the back edge, if you will, because the primary resident and visitor access actually turns off to the left before our entrance would come in. So we did try to respect the separation that the more pedestrian areas up near the building would be a little bit more removed from where we would have folks coming in and out of our site. So um, where we tie in is sort of the more remote, if you will, uh, for that. So we did take a look at that. Well, thanks. I appreciate hearing that. Um, it's good to know that that, that, that thought, <coughs> excuse me, has already gone into that. 
Um, in terms of the building orientation, um, I agree uh, with Ms. Hendrickson about the need to, um, and this is consistent with staff comments as well, try and be very thoughtful about the, the architectural um, approach, in particular to that, that western elevation, western slash northwestern elevation, the extent to which that can be, have some architectural interest and hopefully some function as well. Um, uh, that will certainly improve your chances of sort of being in conformance with those with those design standards and, and having something that's not just sort of a blank wall on the on the on the um, the street there. Um, so I'll certainly look forward to seeing, as I'm sure others will as well, the the architecture, um, assuming we sort of get to that point. Um, beyond that, I don't think I have anything else. Obviously, the traffic. Traffic, traffic. Um, is there anything else you'd like to hear from us in terms of direction or initial feedback? I do appreciate the feedback we've received thus far. I think our next steps will be having a good meeting with the staff and reviewing sort of more detailed uh, information on that and hopefully coming to a solution. And this, this is a piece of property the applicant does own it. He does need to have the ability to somehow mm -hmm. use his property, so we're certainly willing to work to try to find what's the most feasible alternative for the area given the traffic that's in the site. Right, and this is in a, you know, it's in a TVC zone and I think it's in terms of the vision of the town and the sort of the planning uh, goal for the for the town that could be consistent with that. We mm -hmm. um, just have to see whether, how to make it work. Thank you very right. much. Thank you. Item number nine, ENF Limited Liability Company requests an amended site plan review for Land Rover Jaguar, 371 U.S. Route 1, Assessor's Map, U39, Lot 46A. Jay? Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <coughs> Application is before the board actually is part of a uh, request to amend the existing contract zone for the property. Um, so. The process for amending a contract zone is that the applicant were, is to appear before the council for a first reading and consideration, which they have done. And then the next step is to come to this board for a preliminary review. Um, subsequent to the board um, conducting a preliminary review and making its findings and recommendation to the council, the application goes back to council, final adoption of a contract zone before coming back to this board for final site plan review. So um, it's sort of a bit of a back and forth, but that's the process if you want a contract zone. Um, so just by a quick way of background, um, board members may recall it's about this time a year ago this application was before you for ostensibly what is a very similar application. This um, essentially the, uh, this this round is about 1,000 or 1,500 square feet more than we had previously seen. I think you know, the biggest changes from what's existing on site and what the um, uh, contract zone prior to the 2016 approval were are the, the building um, uh, architecture features, which is quite a bit of discussion that the board had with the last round, um, and then it's the square footage. Um, Outside of that, I think a lot of the site elements re remain ostensibly the same from our 2016 approval, so I think you'll see reflected in our staff and peer review comments that we didn't effectively have much to say because we're not too far off from where we were a year ago. Um, so with that, Mr. Chair, we did have some comments, and so I'll turn it back to you. Um, as I said, at this point, I think, you know, based on the board's discussion, you can either ask for the applicant to come back. Um, if you need more information, you can make a rec recommendation to the council, you know, in favor, in favor with conditions, you know, or not in favor. But I think that would be sort of the next step is, you know, sort of a, a recommendation to the council in, in one of those three sort of categories, if you will. All right. That's Thanks, what I have for you. All right. And I'll hand it off to you. <coughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Paul Strowski from Sebago Technics, and with me is Ryan Senator from Ryan Senator Architecture. And Jay, thank you for the uh, history on this. I I don't know how many contract zones Scarborough has, but I'm 
done two of them and from here on out I will be adding a little extra fluff in each one. <laughs> um, as Jay indicated, yeah, this is back for uh, the first review of the planning board. I have already gone through the first uh, reading with town council and I do have a subsequent second reading with town council. Um, and the main reason for being back is because the expansion now at about 1,500 square feet um, actually brought the building, uh, actually I think it's 1,900 square feet is the addition, but it actually brought the overall footprint um, over what the revised contract zone was in 2016. Um, I have now amended that error and I will, like I said, add in a little extra fluff in each one now so I don't have to keep doing this. <laughs> Um, right now the the dealership is approximately 13,600 square feet. Uh, there's going to be a 1,900 square foot addition bringing the total total footprint to about 15,600 square feet. Um, the majority of the building addition is going to be into the front. We're going to add um, basically a new facade. As Jay mentioned, the uh, building architecture is very different um, from what is written in the uh, typical Scarborough ordinance for the Route 1 corridor. Um, going back and forth between the Planning Board and Town Council, the way the draft uh, amendment is written was language that was recommended by uh, Town Staff, Council, and approved by Town Council um, to basically reference architecture similar to the building elevations as prepared by Ryan Senator. Um, the uh, where the service bay currently is, there will be an, ex an addition there. Basically, they're going to be taking over a portion of that service area, so it's being <coughs> displaced. Uh, that area is currently a uh, paved parking area, so we're replacing that with building. The existing um, rock track, which was, um, which is currently present, will be removed. That will be uh, then put to new uh, vehicle display area, uh, and. The overall impervious coverage of the site is going to be reduced because going back through stormwater uh, calculations, that rock track was considered as a non-vegetated area. Um, so we're actually displacing that, adding some grass back. Um, the existing stormwater pond was reviewed last year, uh, found it to be in stable condition. Side slopes were in good shape, good catch of grass. Um, there was a pretty substantial rain event, uh, I think within a week prior to that review. Um, there was no indication that the emergency spillway was activated. Um, there was tall grass behind it and it was all standing all vertical, wasn't laid down, showing that there was a heavy overflow uh, coming through there. Uh, hoping to try to get to a lot of the comments that were raised in uh, <coughs> staff review. Um, Revised building plans, floor plans have been sent to the Sanitary District for their review. Um, as far as erosion control, the existing pavement will be maintained to the greatest extent possible, uh, thereby eliminating the need for a actual stone construction entrance. However, a note's been added to the plan to indicate that the contractor is to sweep the paved parking areas on a daily basis to remove any dust or track off. And that Route 1 should be reviewed at least two times a day uh, for any evidence of uh, material track off and corrective action taken at, at any indication that there's track off getting into Route 1. That is a very heavily traveled area. We don't really have the benefit to having crushed stone laying on the existing pavement, otherwise we'll just demolish that and the rock can come into Route 1. So figure the best course of action is to just indicate to the contractor that they need to take you know, special care uh, eliminating any track off in that area. And as noted that the, you know, building material is different from what is listed in the uh, Route 1 design corridor. It is a very um, uh, would you, high quality material, metal. Um, and again, uh, the language that was written in that contract zone was what was recommended and approved by uh, the council. Um, if there are any um, questions regarding the uh, building material, um, I'll hand it to Ryan for uh, to answer. And I think, did you bring some of the samples? We can pass along to see. It's a very high durable material, um, basically kind of keeping with the new dealership branding. Um, but 
rock track was going, which I know was uh, to the benefit of some board members last time around. So Ryan Senator, the project architect, um, in uh, actually you can see Paul just put up the existing facade condition, um, and I'll I'll put up the, uh, <coughs> the proposed elevation, um, which is essentially um, identical to what we had proposed bef uh, proposed before and had approved. The uh, differences are. Um, uh, the, the main body of the building got uh, two feet wider, and then uh, basically we added a bay onto the surface bay. And this was uh, this was due to um, kind of the the brand requirements re requiring a little bit more program within the building, um, so that kind of forced us to expand the footprint a little bit. Um, you know, just to quickly recap the architecture, um, basically the the brand design um, is a uh, kind of a flat roof building. Um, and we worked with staff on a kind of a, a um, worked with them to kind of go between the uh, the Route One design ordinance um, and the brand standards. We tried to come up with a happy kind of medium uh, to satisfy both requirements, um, which was approved last time. So um, really, no significant architectural change from from the last round. Um, and uh, we're passing around the, the material. It's a very high quality. Uh, metal panel material, which I'm, you've probably seen on a lot of dealerships. A lot of dealerships are using it this, these days. Um, but I think it's a very clean, crisp design, and uh, uh, in the spirit of the gables of an interpretation of uh, uh, what the uh, kind of the ordinance is getting at. So, with, if you have any questions, we're certainly here uh, to address. Them. All right. Thank you. Anyone have any comments or questions? I do not. No? Okay. Rachel? Uh, yeah, I wasn't here when you came, when this came through originally. So you have a second floor. Where would that be? Yeah, so um, it's, a, it's a kind of a small portion of the building. Um, the, the showroom space is a 16 foot uh, ceiling height, so it's a tall ceiling height, kind of in the back portion of this uh, part of the building is a mezzanine, which is primarily storage. There is a, a, an, um, <coughs> a, a kind of a kitchenette uh, break room that does have a window on the side of the building, but primarily up there is a storage area. So as I recall the facility now, it's basically, the color is basically white, most of... Yes, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, pretty much yeah. white so. and a green. So. That was their brand standard uh, 10 years ago. So now, now it will go to the gray and metallic, the gray and the champagne metallic, yeah. which actually will blend in a little more with the background than the current white does. Yeah, it'll have less contrast. No, uh, thank you. I have no further questions. Thank you. Um, yeah, I don't have a whole lot to add or comment on either. I appreciate the, the point by point uh, review of the responses to the comments. I appreciate the responsiveness on that. Um, I'm okay with the architecture. Again, it's not too different from what the board approved last year. I uh, do appreciate the flexibility working with staff on, you know, getting away from the plain old flat roof. Um, obviously, the they are contemporary materials, but they're not, you know, shiny or reflective. And I think it's a, you know, a subtle enough um, approach that I'm comfortable with, with that being in conformance. Um, and uh, in terms of the, you know, the the, uh, the marginal increase in square footage, it's a pretty de minimis amount. So um, I think I'm fine with this. And I don't know that we need to. Do we need to have a? Do we have a? Just a straw poll or a general nodding of heads? Yeah, I think 
drop regarding, off. Uh, okay. okay. Yeah, I, I think it needs preliminary approval right. technically to go back right. to right. town right. council. Yep. Yep. Right. So it's a question of whether it's, it's, it doesn't quite rise to a motion, <coughs> but um, I just have a show of hands I'm in right. agreement that we're sending a positive recommendation back to the council for this for the next step. Can I just, yeah, just one question. Um, car dealerships, don't they tend to want to change their appearance every so, every number of years or something like that? Yeah, that's yeah. pretty much why we're here. Basically. Yeah. Every well, and, and years they come up with so yeah. Okay, so you'll be back here in 10 we'll years. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe a year. Or not. Hopefully I've added just enough fluff that I don't have to go to council. Oh. <laughs> okay. That's all. All right. Thank you. So, Right, let the record show that the board has given a positive recommendation to the council and uh, the applicant can take the next step. Great, thank okay. you. Thank you. Good, Good evening. And can we keep these material samples for the record? Is that great? Yes. Do you want me to put them in mind? Yes, I trust you more than myself. Yes. <laughs> All right. Absolutely. I, I hear what you're saying. Okay, he's slowly accumulating material so he can decide if <laughs> else. Mm -hmm. yeah. One of these days I'll get there, honey. So again, as noted at the top of the meeting, item number 10, um, Yellow Birch Estates was tabled. So that takes us to staff report. Um, yep. So one thing uh, just like to make mention for all planning board members, particularly the newer board members, and it goes for all, as I said, is um, MMA, May Municipal Association, puts on a training for planning boards and board of appeals members. And there's actually one coming up. Is it this coming Tuesday? Like, not tomorrow Tuesday, but the following? Is that the correct? Following Tuesday. Yep, next week, Tuesday, right in Saco. Um, so if anyone's interested in attending that, um, I've been to them in the past. They are very good. Um, we can certainly get you signed up. Just go through Karen. There will be another one later in the year in Lewiston, um, which isn't too, too far if that works better for your schedule. So um, like I said, court Karen, if that is something you're interested in. How long is the training? Is it? Oh, I three think it lasts hours? about two to three hours. Yeah, three yep. hours. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm interested if you can get the information to me. Yep. And we can get you signed up and everything. So yeah, I can um, just sign you up. I'll send you the brochure. Yeah, so I know yeah. timing and everything. Yep. Mm -hmm. Very Great. Good. Um, do you want to make an announcement? Of, I'll turn it to Angela. Tomorrow night is the Pine Point Master Plan public meeting down at Engine Four, so down at Pine Point Fire Station. We're going to have um, a presentation and hopefully, hopefully get some feedback from the residents down there. And it's obviously open to the public. Um, it's at 6 o'clock, right at the fire station. Um, and Transportation Committee will be there, right, Roger? Right, with our caps and everything. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's very timely given, obviously, the time of the year, time of year and mm -hmm. all the people who are around and the level of activity down there and the fact that the garage is up and running and there have been some improvements to the, to the, the streets down there and there obviously are other other things in the works. Mm. Right, so we're looking at a roadway project on East Grand Avenue, um, which, yeah, we've done some improvements on Pine Point, so it'll be kind of continuing that effort, um, as well as looking at, down the road, looking at what happens at the intersection, what happens on the other side of that intersection, and really um, how it all fits together. Great, thank you. Uh, do we have an administrative amendment report? I don't believe we have anything to report on this time around. I don't remember anything. No. <laughs> so, <clears throat> must not have happened. No. Any planning board correspondence beyond the email that um, was referenced earlier? And actually, mm -hmm. just on that point, if I could just note, the reason why I provide you Susan Ogilis' email sort of during the meeting was so that there wouldn't be any representation or couldn't be any sort of perception of ex parte communication. So I would say if you aren't able to attend or you do have items that you want other board members to think about, send them to me. I'll provide them during the meeting. Um, and that way it's all above board and part of the transparent public process. So um, that's why you didn't see that prior to the meeting, unlike a, a general public comment that comes in that you all get to see and sort of think about. Um, just 
But for what it's worth, that's why that one was a little different than maybe some other public comments. Or yeah. Thank you. <coughs> Planning board comments. <coughs> oh, well, this is my first formal slash public opportunity to congratulate our new town planner. Thank you. I think the town chose wisely and look forward to working with you mm -hmm. going forward. Great. As, as on the planning I. board and Long Range Planning Committee and other contexts. So congratulations. Thank you. And if there are no other comments, I'll move to adjourn. Second. Is that a comment or are you voting I, to adjourn? Well, I was waiting. <laughs> I didn't know where. I have to, to report about the Transportation Committee. The floor is yours. Gotta, you got to jump in <laughs> faster, yeah. Roger. Well, I didn't know where it was, on, you know, where you wanted me to say something. Uh, we had a meeting on the uh, 27th of June, and we had Larissa Crockett, who is the assistant town manager, and there was an extensive discussion about uh, public transportation, primarily about bus routes, where to place bus stops. It's a real challenge in this town, and there's also the challenge of um, trying to create or establish some sort of a culture in the town you know, to consider using public transportation. So uh, that's going to be a, a long, tough road ahead, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, there was also, um, and that took up quite a bit of the meeting. It's, it's really, I've only been to about three transportation committee meetings so far, and it's amazing how much activity this, there is going on in town regarding the roadway, roads and, and uh, considerations of those. So, um, there's also discussions about uh, joint application uh, with PACs uh, between Soccer and Skyro, which just helps our possibilities for any kind of assistance in the future, especially on Route 1. And uh, then the, the last uh, the last portion of it was just, just a discussion with Angela <coughs> talk about Route 1, I mean, that fine point, and what's going on down there. That's it. I make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> Second. All in favor? Yes. Thank you. Good night.